Hi, I'm Mary Kopsinski, the CEO of Regolytics. Welcome to this week's regulatory roundup. This week, there were 216 regulatory updates having to do with financial services and insurance in the United States. The regulator of the week is the SEC. First, the SEC is proposing to change the definition of accredited investor. I will add that yours truly was cited in Forbes on this very topic. To summarize a 145 page document for you, the proposals do a few things to make it easier to qualify as an accredited investor. For those of you needing a little bit more background, one of the purposes of the SEC is to protect investors. Thanks stock market crash of 1929 and the Great Depression, that's when the SEC was invented. They came up with the definition of accredited investor, which was essentially an investor that was sophisticated enough to qualify for higher risk products. It reviews this definition every four years, but it's only been changed three times in SEC history. Some people are upset because they don't feel like the changes go far enough because they don't like the idea that sophistication is merely linked to the amount of money you have. They wanted to see more protections for situations that create elder abuse, for example. If you've had many decades to save, then yes, you'll qualify as an accredited investor, but this is where we run into issues with elder abuse where certain people move their money into very risky assets and lose it all, causing them not to be able to retire. Or worse, not be able to care for themselves and the government has to step in. So people who wanted to see more exclusions to the definition of accredited investor are unhappy. But those who were looking for some carve outs so that they could be an accredited investor are happy. The SEC did carve out a few more things that made you sophisticated, even though you didn't have enough cash on hand. They reserve the right to change these rules, but for now, if you have a series seven, 65 or 82, you're automatically qualified. Also, if you are a knowledgeable employee of a private fund. So yeah, you might be a junior, intern for a VC that reviews deals all the time. Well, if you can scrape up enough money to qualify to get involved in those investments and you're considered a knowledgeable employee, then you're going to be allowed to participate. The other thing the rule does, which modernizes it, is to clarify that if you're married, it's a joint aggregate of your financials that make you qualified. And the SEC also included in this definition, same-sex marriages and civil unions. The SEC also included a number of legal entities that can be considered accredited investors that weren't allowed to before, like Indian tribes, labor unions, foreign companies, family offices. There were a number of these legal entities that just previously weren't allowed to ever become an accredited investor. Now they can. The second reason that the SEC is the regulator of the week is that they also proposed amendment to update certain auditor independence requirements as a response to feedback they received from the public. The new rules tailor the independence analysis on relationships or services that are more likely to pose a threat to the auditor's objectivity or impartiality. There are certain clarifications around affiliates, for example. So if you worked for company A, company A is affiliated with company B, you might not be able to be impartial around company A, but you probably could for company B. It also shortens the look back period. So if you worked for a company a number of years ago, things have changed by now and you can probably still become impartial. The third and fourth reason the SEC is the regulator of the week are some interesting things that the SEC had to say about blockchain and cryptocurrency. First, they issued a warning about IEOs or initial exchange offerings. IEOs are a recent development in the rapidly evolving digital asset space. They're similar to initial coin offerings, ICOs, in that they are initial offerings of a digital asset with the purpose of raising capital. However, 
IEOs are being touted as an innovation on ICOs because they're offered directly by online trading platforms on behalf of companies, usually for a fee, that provide immediate trading opportunities for these digital assets. Sound too good to be true? Well, it probably is, because let us not forget that the SEC stands for the Securities and Exchange Commission, which means if you're an exchange, you have to register with the SEC. So these online trading platforms are typically not registered with the SEC and they improperly refer to themselves as exchanges. So before you invest, check with the SEC to ensure that that digital platform is registered. And finally, the SEC is the regulator of the week for fining two blockchain companies, raising over 30 million from hundreds of investors in a fraudulent initial coin offering or ICO. The defendants marketed and sold digital asset securities in a purported effort to develop technologies for hedge funds and other investors in digital assets. And apparently, one of the guys even darkened his hair, grew a beard, and used aliases to hide his identity and conceal the fact that he had served a year in prison for his participation in the collapse of a large Canadian hedge fund. The topic of the week is renewable energy. Over the last few weeks, there have been some regulatory moves around renewable energy. We hadn't previously tracked it because it wasn't considered financial or insurance issues, but guess what? With all the momentum in the climate change space, and especially with BlackRock's recent announcement that their investors would be infuriated with them for not considering climate impacts in their investment decisions, a number of regulators are taking note and considering whether their rules need a climate refresh. This week, the FHFA, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, which is the regulator for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, as well as all federal home loan banks, is looking for public input on their residential energy retrofitting programs that are financed through special state legislation that allows for what is called a super priority lien over existing and subsequent first mortgages. These state programs, called PACE programs, or Property Assessed Clean Energy, address residential properties and commercial applications. And a number of states have been issuing PACE-related requests as well. Uh, so be sure to subscribe to Regolytics to follow those as they come out. And in specific state regulatory policy around energy, the governor of Rhode Island issued an executive order that is committing Rhode Island to be powered 100% by renewable electricity by the end of the decade. Her order directs the state's Office of Energy and Resources to conduct a economic and energy market strategy to develop actionable policies and programs to reach this goal. In our find tracker this week, Golden State Bank in Glendale, California, agreed to a settlement with the FDIC and the California Department of Business Oversight over their Bank Secrecy Act and anti-money laundering program. While the bank doesn't admit or deny wrongdoing, take a look at what they did and make sure you're not doing it. Also in fines, there was an interesting settlement with 21 states and the District of Columbia with the PayPal Charitable Giving Fund. PayPal had created an ability for users to send funds to charities, but didn't follow the local charity rules around disclosure, etc. As a former nonprofit fundraiser, I found this interesting, and I know a number of colleagues in the impact investing space would find it interesting as well. For those of you following data privacy, the FDC nailed five more companies on the EU-US Privacy Shield framework. There's a smattering of these every week, so much that I can hardly call it news. But if you're not following them and you're in data privacy, you are really missing out. 
Also in fines, the OCC nailed a Texas bank and an Illinois bank for unsound practices. The Texas bank had issues relating to strategic planning, capital planning, credit risk management, allowance for loan and lease losses, ALLL methodology, and liquidity risk management. The Illinois bank had issues with earning, liquidity risk management, credit administration, information technology, and consumer compliance. In other news, FinCEN is seeking feedback on their BSA e-filing system for credit unions. And my beloved Idaho, proud of winning the least regulated state last year, issued two executive orders explicitly focused on ensuring that future regulations are streamlined. So hey, Governor Little, if you're listening to me, let's talk. Let's discuss how your regulation can really be streamlined in a way that we at Regalytics like to call hashtag smart regs or reg chain. So join the revolution. And to any of you viewers watching, if you know a regulator in Idaho who might have access to Governor Little, send him my way. And finally, the Pennsylvania Department of Banking and Securities is having a special event for investing in women because apparently the number of Pennsylvania women saving for retirement or investing is lower than the national average. There's lots of fun stuff this week in Cyber Corner. Treasury's Advisory Committee on Risk Sharing Mechanisms is meeting in February to talk about sharing risk with our international constituents through the Terrorism Risk Insurance Program, or TRIP. Essentially, it's where countries pre-fund risk exposures for things like nuclear, biological, chemical, and radiology risk, as well as cyber insurance and other issues associated with cyber-related losses. The meeting is public, so if you're following this stuff, enjoy. The Commerce Department considers itself America's data agency, and as co-leader of the data goal in the president's management agenda is leading an improvement project on how all federal agencies make data accessible and useful to the American public. Again, smart regs. I also thought this was interesting out of Indiana that they were hosting a speaker series called The Art of the Possible designed to address Innovation in Indiana, the keynote is the former IT director of USCIS, AKA Immigration, and he is now at Amazon Web Services. Should be a very interesting discussion. Also last week, the FDIC is proposing a regulatory sandbox that would help support FDIC supervised and insured institutions to innovate. They asked for comments in November and got None. So they are reissuing it and ask for comments. So my fellow fintech and regtech founders, let's let the FDIC know what we think. Also interesting, the IRS is having a public hearing on their recent proposed rule that has to do with classifying cloud transactions, computer programs, and transfers of digital content. The question is, should the stuff be taxed and how? They're looking at it from a local as well as an international bent, so join the hearing and give your comments. And in Crypto Corner, two things. One, Texas issued a warning to investors identifying cryptocurrency as something that should, quote, always get your common sense tingling. Two, the FTC settled charges with a number of companies that were involved in a credit repair scheme where they essentially claimed to be able to scrub your credit data, even if it was accurate. And of course, they weren't able to deliver that to customers. The most interesting part is that the companies were Wyoming based. And for those of you who don't know, Wyoming is pushing to be the best place to do business for crypto or blockchain related companies. In the settlement, some of the companies were forced to disclose their assets, bank accounts, credit information, and crypto holdings. Finally, in Cannabis Corner, the Pennsylvania Insurance Department produced its biannual list of public officials that are involved in the development 
of regulation or policy relating to medical marijuana organizations. And that's it this week for Regolytics U.S. Alerts. Join us every Wednesday morning on LinkedIn for your quick summary of financial regulatory updates and the long version on our YouTube channel.